Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you here today. Um, if you haven't already, please put your phone on silent. I um, want to thank everyone for joining us and thank our great panelists um, that are going to be up after me. Um, our agenda today is I'm going to present for about 20 minutes on a report that Pacific Institute released on measuring progress towards universal access to water and sanitation in California, which presents a framework for how to monitor issues around water and sanitation in the state. Um, and then I'm going to open it up for some questions and answers from you, the audience, and then turn it over to our panel. We have Joaquin Esquivel from the State Water Board moderating and a great um, selection of panelists here to comment on issues around how to monitor water and sanitation in the state. Um, we have Heather Cooley here from Pacific Institute, who is our research director. She'll introduce our organization to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for being here today. Uh, uh, I am, and my colleague Laura from the Pacific Institute. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit research uh, group. We were founded in 1987, uh, and our mission is to create and advance solutions to the world's uh, most pressing water challenges. Um, we, uh, our strategy is, is focused on sort of producing research that advances sustainable environment, uh, healthy economy, and social equity with science-based solutions. Um, and about half of our work is international and half is domestic, mostly in California and the West. And I think you'll see what I think are some of the value of that in the work that Laura will be presenting today, where she's taking some of the um, work that's been done internationally and applying it here in a California context. So without further ado, let me hand it off to uh, my colleague, Laura uh, Feinstein who is a senior researcher at the Pacific Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the overview of the presentation today, we'll go through some of the background, policy context, the problem with water and sanitation in the state, and our research objective and approach, and then go into results and recommendations from the report. So many of you in the room are probably familiar with this, but it does seem like there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to measuring water and sanitation in the state, and no one person is necessarily apprised of everything. Um, the legislature passed the Human Right to Water statute in 2012, declaring that every Californian has the right to safe, affordable, accessible drinking water adequate for cooking, cleaning, and sanitary purposes. Uh, but that bill in itself doesn't have um, any teeth to it, really. It doesn't require any particular implementation measures on the part of the state. However, it has really set um, a baseline or a set of values for the state to, uh, to look forward to and has spurred, um, I would say, a number of other actions, such as the Water Board's resolution adopting the human right to water as a core value, which directed their staff to develop performance measures for monitoring progress towards delivering uh, of water and sanitation universally in California. The Department of Water Resources, meanwhile, is working on their water plan update for 2018. Um, the mission of that is to develop a shared vision of what sustainable water management is in California, and one component of that is metrics towards delivering water and sanitation. Um, and also, it's not on this list, but the California Public Utilities Commission is busy with a rulemaking on affordability metrics. And then, um, as uh, you all in the legislature are well aware, the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund has been vigorously debated in the past year. It had a few different manifestations, which did fail to pass in 2018, but it is expected to be revisited in 2019. And one of the major questions that always came up in the debate was how big is this problem? How do we really wrap our arms around it and understand where our priorities are and how many resources we need to address it? So before we launch into a discussion of how to monitor these problems and what we don't know, I want to first sort of lay out some of the big issues that we do know exist with access to water and sanitation. Because while we don't have the most perfect and comprehensive overview of these problems, we do know enough to say that there are substantial issues. So for example, half a million Californians were served by public water systems that were out of compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act in 2018. This is a woman, Maricela Maris Alatore, who has been um, uh, advocating for safe water in her community for over a decade. We know that there have been problems of water scarcity during the most recent drought, which is only uh, sort of a foreshadowing of things to come as our climate changes. 
There were 5,000 private well shortages reported to the counties, and half a million people were served by drought-impacted public water systems, public water systems that either reported an actual shortage of water or an impending one. And uh, in most cases, these well shortages and drought-impacted public water systems served disadvantaged communities. On the sanitation end of the spectrum, we also know that there are about 200,000 people in the state that lack consistent, reliable access to a private indoor toilet. This um, chart is from a report that will be out uh, shortly from Pacific Institute. Um, we're drawing from a couple different data sources to make this assessment. The blue bar on the bottom that is the 89,000 people who live in homes in California that do not have private indoor flush toilets. So these sometimes are people who are living in RVs or vans. Um, they don't have their own toilet. They live sometimes in substandard housing, like a detached garage. Many of them live in um, what's known as single resident occupancies. So they have a room in a larger building with a shared toilet, which is not an ideal way to use a toilet. We'll discuss that more later. And then the um, remaining groups are the 68,000 are unsheltered homeless, people sleeping on the streets. They typically often have to go miles sometimes to find an actual flush toilet or a place to wash their hands. And then a remaining 52,000 are the sheltered homeless, so they do go someplace indoors to sleep at night, but they're typically turned out of that shelter for about 12 hours a day and don't have access to sanitation for that period of time. And we know that this is a problem that is having an impact on public health when we saw the largest hepatitis A outbreak in recent memory in San Diego and LA counties. And it did originate among the homeless populations who were doing outdoor defecation with no places to wash their hands. So what are the information gaps on access to water and sanitation? Um, we don't know as much as we should about the very small water systems. So about one and a half million Californians or actually it's, it's a little more than that. It's about 4% of the population relies on a system that's too small to be regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So these are um, usually private wells. Um, they're serving up to 15 connections. Um, they might be lightly regulated a bit at the local level, but there's relatively little oversight. They aren't subject to the Safe Drinking Water Act. We don't know much about their water quality. We don't know whether they're testing regularly or doing treatment or doing the types of maintenance that's required to keep these systems safe. We know very little about septic systems. There's about 1.4 million septics in the state. Maintaining a septic system costs money and takes effort. Uh, people are busy, especially if you're a low-income person, you're working a job, you don't have a lot of resources. That couple of hundred dollars to clean out your septic system may not float to the top of your priority list every year. And I think Michael Claiborne's gonna to touch on some of Leadership Council's efforts to monitor the health impacts of the problems of leaky septics in the state. And then affordability. With affordability, the problem is a bit different. We actually do have data on water rates in the state. Our challenge in that area is that we really have no consensus on how we should define and measure affordability. So reaching some kind of decision about what the metric should be will allow us to move forward with our understanding in that space. So we came out with this report um, in September on measuring progress towards universal access to water and sanitation in California. Our goal was to say, what does safe, affordable, accessible water look like in California in terms that are concrete and measurable and aligned with the state's laws and norms? And we took an approach that's been well honed on the international level, which is known as service ladders. So the World Health Organization and the United Nations have for years now been working within um, a framework for monitoring water and sanitation and they track progress towards their goals internationally um, with these consistent metrics. And they focus on the quality of service at the household level. That doesn't mean that they don't monitor and track water systems um, or wastewater systems, but ultimately they don't assume that just because there's a functioning water system in an area that it effectively serves every household in that area. So they always use the household as their unit of measurement because that's where people's health is impacted. Um, and this is a very useful way of thinking about the problem because they lay out a number of different levels of access to water, so they don't just say is water safe or unsafe. Is it affordable or unaffordable? They have five tiers 
of quality of service, which is simultaneously enough to give you a little bit of complexity, but simple enough that you can develop big maps and charts and see bigger patterns emerging and compare country to country or year to year progress being made. The one issue with the way the international community uses these service ladders is that if you look at them, the standards are quite a bit lower than what we expect in California. So for example, uh, uh, safe water quality would be considered water free from fecal and priority chemical contamination, which is just arsenic and I think uh, arsenic and perhaps nitrates. So when you're looking at, for example, water that has high lead levels, we would not consider that safe, of course, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, but under um, the World Health Organization and UN's monitoring program, that water would be considered perfectly safe. So clearly their standards are not really up to the level that we expect. So we, uh, these service ladders are meant to be customized. They are presented with that premise that you can adjust them to local norms, and that's what we did. So uh, I'll go into our results on the California-specific service ladders. Um, we developed five service ladders, safe water, affordable water and sanitation, accessible water, safe sanitation, and accessible sanitation. And we tweaked them for the California context we were very careful to look at prevailing statutes and regulations and try to align them with our various rungs in the service ladder. And we also were very careful to align our metrics with public data sets. So we're not proposing here that there's going to be a new massive census program for water and sanitation. What we're saying is that you can take existing data sets, such as those collected by the US Census or collected under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and feed those in to these service ladders and develop a sense of where, what kind of service people are receiving. So first, safe drinking water. Um, so drinking water is often described in these sort of binary terms. It's either safe or it's unsafe. You often see headlines that say a million Californians have unsafe water. But there's very little interrogation of exactly what those terms really mean. And actually describing whether water is safe or unsafe is extremely complex, right? There's about 100 enforceable standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act. They vary in their importance. Some of them are monitoring uh, contaminants that have chronic health impacts, so it takes many years to have a measurable impact on the health of the community. Others are for um, contaminants that have acute impacts. If you drink it just once or twice, you can get really sick and end up in the hospital. Um, you can exceed an MCL by an extreme amount or by a very tiny amount. You can exceed it um, sometimes for a period of hours and then the utility corrects it. Sometimes these violations go on for years. Or sometimes they reoccur. That's a problem one day, it gets fixed, and then it crops up again perhaps the next winter when it starts to rain. So what we mean by safe and unsafe is actually really hard to say. People haven't really come, I would say, to a common definition of what those terms mean. And there, and there is no legal definition of what safe water is, other than does your utility meet the standards of the Safe Drinking Water Act? But then the question always is, for how long, right? Because almost every utility will occasionally have a violation. So how long do you have to be in compliance for your water to be safe? So we tried to tackle these bigger issues of thinking about how you can take something as complex as the Safe Drinking Water Act and feed it into a few simple standards for what is safe, satisfactorily moderate, marginal, and unacceptably safe water. And we also took into account some of the other ways that water is regulated besides the Safe Drinking Water Act. So I'm not gonna um, dwell on these service ladders in detail because there's obviously a ton of information here. I'm just gonna give you kind of a rundown of a few major points on each one. And then you can go look at the report if you're interested for all the details. But what we said uh, our goal was for safe drinking water is that chemicals regulated by the state and federal Safe Drinking Water Act standards should be consistently below levels that pose a significant risk to health. And how would you actually measure that? Well, for example, we said that satisfactory um, safe drinking water would be a household served by a public water system that has been without an enforcement action under the SDWA during the last three years for state or federal drinking water standards. So you haven't had a problem meeting the Safe Drinking Water Act standards for the past three years continuously. Moderately safe water would be a household served by a public water system that either has been without an enforcement action for an acute 
drinking water standard for the last three years and has been without an enforcement action lasting more than one monitoring period for the last three years for a chronic drinking water standard. So we're trying to bifurcate a little bit between those standards that are for acute contaminants versus chronic. And then down in marginal, we talk about uh, drinking bottled water that's regulated by the US Federal and Drug Administration, which is less rigorously monitored than public tap water, even though everybody thinks bottled water safe, that's a sign. we won't get distracted with that. And, uh, <laughs> and also wells that are meeting the voluntary guidelines on, um, on testing and treatment. There are no mandatory guidelines on private domestic well quality. And then finally, unacceptable would be that any of the characteristics of, a, of at least marginal access is not met. So you're gonna see that this sort of pattern of unacceptable meaning that at least marginal isn't met is kind of carried out over most of these service ladders. So moving on to accessible drinking water. So accessible drinking water gets a lot less attention than safe drinking water. And then in turn, uh, I would say accessible and affordable get less attention than safe drinking water. And then in turn, sanitation, of course, is always the neglected, the neglected sibling in the water and sanitation partnership. Uh, so accessible water should be available in the home in sufficient volumes to meet domestic needs at hot and cold temperatures 24 hours a day. Okay, so why did we come up with that goal? Well, first of all, we looked at California statutes which legally require homes to have hot and cold running water. And we also looked at the best source of data on running water in the home, which is the American Community Survey. And for better or for worse, the American Community Survey only notes down whether a home has hot and cold running water or doesn't. So it doesn't, for example, note if a household has indoor cold running water but doesn't have a hot water heater. So we're kind of stuck. If we don't want to have to start doing our own multi-million dollar survey every year, we pretty much have to use hot and cold indoor running water as our indicator of accessible water in the home. And uh, we also came up with uh, a standard that 43 gallons per capita a day is sufficient to meet essential indoor needs. And this is based on studies of indoor water use in California, um, which actually allowed us to subtract out the amount of water people use for leaks, which is typically about nine gallons per person per day. So here's our service ladder for accessible drinking water. Satisfactorily accessible would be at least 43 gallons per capita a day of hot and cold indoor piped potable water available 24 hours a day. That's probably what most of us have in our homes. And then um, it sort of goes down in quality from there. So for example, moderate would be um, that it's not in your housing unit, but it is on the premises. So that might be a single resident occupancy where you share your kitchen and, and bathroom. Marginal access would be um, that it's not on your premises, that you have to walk some distance to acquire that water. And it's available to you at least 12 hours a day. So that would be perhaps a homeless person who has been provided some access to water and sanitation, but it's far from, far from the ideal situation. And then any of the characteristics of marginal access is not met, is unacceptable. And affordable drinking water. So the concept of how to define and measure affordable drinking water has been a subject of quite a bit of debate recently. On the federal level, the EPA has opened a process to try to reevaluate how they measure affordability. Um, part of the issue there is that um, there was a, a standard put out uh, a couple of decades ago um, for tracking financial capacity of water utilities, and uh, it measured affordability, affordable water bills as um, the percentage of the median household income. So you have your average water bill from, say, LA Department of Water and Power, and you look at the median household income in LA, and you take the bill as a percentage of median household income. And lo and behold, median household income in LA is quite high, and it looks like LA has no affordability problems. However, there are large numbers of people, even within very wealthy areas of the state, that are living on very limited incomes who may struggle to pay a $60 or $70 monthly water bill, as is typical in the state these days. So we proposed a better metric um, that looks at not the average water bill, but essential indoor water use that would consider the range of income between households, not just the median household income, that would take into account local cost of living because the same income in Fresno is different from the same income in San Francisco, and would consider the cost of both water and wastewater if possible. 
because they are often not always paid on the same bill. So we proposed a metric that uh, satisfactorily affordable water would be a household spending less than or equal to 10% of its discretionary income on essential water and sanitation needs. So discretionary income would be um, your income minus your expenses on food, rent, childcare, healthcare, taxes, all the things you have to pay to survive. What's left over is your discretionary income. You take your water bill and divide it by that. So this 10% figure looks surprisingly high relative to the traditional metric of about 2%, but when you t actually look at what discretionary income is for a low-income household in California, it is very small. Once people pay, once a low-income family pays for food, housing, shelter, um, taxes, they have very little left over. So 10% of discretionary income for a low-income family is actually usually on the scale of about $30 a month, depending on what, what area you're talking about. Uh, moving on to the sanitation end, sanitation always gets less traction than drinking water. However, they are inextricably linked. Um, if you have, you can have safe drinking water, um, and if you have um, a leaky septic or you have an uh, underfunctioning wastewater system, you are being exposed to all the same disease-causing contaminants in your environment as you are trying to avoid by drinking safe drinking water. Um, you really can't have the, the public health goods that are enmeshed in safe drinking water if you don't also have safe sanitation. Um, so we define safe and accessible sanitation as a clean, private, flush toilet connected to a well-maintained, centralized wastewater facility or septic system. So the idea here is basically you can use a toilet safely and that waste is released or reused um, safely into the environment. Our service ladder for self -sanit safe sanitation is a flush toilet connected to a well-maintained sewage system or an on-site wastewater treatment system. And uh, you can actually get data for these metrics um, from both the US, combined from the American Community Survey and for the American Housing Survey to develop a sense of how well um, access to san or safe sanitation is being met in California. And then everything sort of goes down from there, the quality of the toilet and or the quality of the sewage disposal system declines as you go down the ladder. And accessible sanitation is very similar. Again, it's a household that has 24 access to a functioning toilet not shared with other households. So it would be your own private toilet. Um, we put uh, a household with um, a functioning toilet that is shared in our moderate level. This has actually been a topic of a vigorous debate in the international community where a lot of people actually do use shared toilets. Um, and it's something we're thinking about in California as well. A lot of affordable housing options in California rely on shared toilets as a way to keep building costs down. So single resident occupancies, for example, in LA and San Francisco are some of the most affordable housing. They're often a transitional zone for, for people who are homeless getting off the streets. Um, However, if you look, for example, at San Francisco Department of Public Health, they did um, a survey of the SROs in their city, and within one year, SROs had 400 public health violations for unhygienic bathrooms. So shared, shared sanitation is sort of essential for affordable housing in the state, but the flip side is that it has to be well maintained or it simply becomes unusable. And this is sort of the place where water and housing kind of meet in California. You really can't solve some of our access to water problems without also starting to think about how we're going to address all of our housing problems. So what are our next steps um, that we envision for this information? We think the most important next step, and we don't mean this just for Pacific Institute, we mean this sort of as a state, is that we need to develop a shared understanding of what is safe, affordable, accessible water and sanitation. Um, it seems like every, many people kind of came to a realization that we needed to do a better job of tracking these issues and identifying problems proactively. And that's why we saw at the beginning that there was an effort at the Water Board, there's an effort at Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, as we'll hear. There's efforts by NGOs like ourselves. There's efforts at the California Public Utilities Commission. But we need to all start talking and working together and collaborating and deciding um, how we're going to develop one shared framework. Um, 
for our particular service ladders that we've put out, we envision these being customizable. We don't see these as being, you know, we think this is the only way to measure water and sanitation. Rather, we think they kind of serve almost as a checklist of all the components that we think need to be addressed in an effective framework for monitoring. Um, we think that uh, you don't need to start a completely new monitoring program, that the first step would be to use existing public data sets to start to fill in numbers for these performance measures and develop charts and maps and start to identify problems proactively. Right now, a lot of the way that funding is allocated for water and sanitation in the state is when a community, often assisted by an NGO partner, puts in an application because they need some assistance. That kind of uh, assumes that communities have NGOs to support them or that they have the resources themselves to apply for assistance. We don't really know how many communities are out there with problems that haven't had the resources even to raise their hand and say they need assistance. So we need to start looking proactively and looking in areas where a lot of the fantastic NGOs in the state are less active. You know, a lot of NGOs are working in the Central Valley to a lesser extent Salinas Valley, Coachella Valley, but we don't know very much about what's going on in the wealthier urban areas and the kind of low income pockets. And we don't know much, I would say, what's going on in the far north of the state and all the tribal lands. And last, I would say, you know, the, the, the real service of having a monitoring system is that it allows you to do adaptive management. So you can track the impact of funded projects and if they are not in fact improving situation in the community, you can change course as necessary. So in the long run, it should make our resources more effective. So if you're interested in more information, the full report is on our website. We have copies of the executive summary for you to take. Um, we also, you know, I didn't go through this today, but we also in the report offer all the data sources that you can use to actually feed into these metrics. Um, and we have links to them so that you can start to look at them yourselves and see whether they are useful. Uh, we also put out some companion reports. Uh, one is called a survey of efforts to achieve universal access to water and sanitation in California, which looks at all the different programs that the state agencies and NGOs have going on. And then coming soon, we'll have a report on Californians with incomplete plumbing. And um, with that, I'll leave you with a pretty interesting quote that we heard from one of our interviews. This is Horacio Amesquita. He's a general manager at San Gerardo Cooperativa. He said, if there isn't a way to apply the human right to water law, if there aren't financial and human resources dedicated to making it a reality, the law is not meaningful. It's just dormant. It's just sitting there. So I think our task is to try to carry this out and make it meaningful. And with that, I'll take your questions. <laughs> yeah, Jack. You always have questions. This is Jack, Jack Watts, California Water Association. Can you go back to the service ladder? Yeah, which one? The drinking water, sorry. Safe drinking water? Yeah. And under the affordability, I think there needs to be another. Oh, affordability? Yeah, under the affordability uh, cells, uh, column there. And then, and then, I'm sorry, it was the other one. Mm-hmm. I was looking at the report, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's the, uh, page uh, four of the report. Mm. And the affordability column mm -hmm. here is, is mainly from the household's point of view. Yes, and that's true. I think you need to, you need to, add, you need to add another column or cells mm -hmm. from the system's point of view. Mm -hmm. There are lots of systems out there that have the technical manager are actually managing to get by, but their system is in such bad shape and go anytime. I know of at least three that mm -hmm. I'm trying to help right now in that mm -hmm. exact position. Yes. And it's, I, to me, their position is not only untenable mm -hmm. for, the, for the system, but also for the customer. It's unacceptable. Yeah. And, and these systems need, and now we're talking about small, I'm talking about small ones, 100 mm -hmm. connections, 150 connections, 211 connections. And so they're under your 10,000, uh, you mm -hmm. know, under the 10,000 population. But they're, to me, those are the, they're almost, the, the population is effective, maybe equal to all the population that you're talking about here yep. on the unsafe, under the unsafe measure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, uh, we've got to figure out a way to, you know, 
to help those. They need the money. I, each of these systems need 100 grand minimum mm -hmm. just to get themselves back to some margin of safety. Because they're all three of them, in my opinion, they, they can go at any time. And then now we're in the bottled water, and it's a, it's a big yep. ago. And I, just, I think we, that's what needs to be publicized as well in a, in a report like this. Yeah, I agree with you. So. I think what you're talking about is the, the financial capacity yeah. perspective. So so those cases where the water bill is quite low, so it's affordable from the household perspective, but the system is on the verge of failing financially. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. I think we do address it in, um, in the text of the report. We talk a little bit about um, ancillary metrics on affordability, and we talk about that. Um, I mean, I think that one thing where the debate on affordability has gotten muddled up is I think there's two issues wrapped up in there. One is affordability for the household, and the other is system financial capacity. Um, and I do think we need to have a conversation about where exactly that fits. I'm not sure that it exactly fits here in a monitoring of quality of delivery of service of the household. It's more um, about the system health, which is, of course, an essential underpinning. But um, I do think we probably could use any, any robust effort to monitor these problems. We'll probably monitor both at the household and the system level. And I think that if you start, if you do, if you develop like the parallel to this for the systems, the health of the water delivery systems in the state, then I think that's where you have your financial capacity indicator. Yeah, it, it, it's not practical to do, but if we could do these, if somehow we could do the electronic mm -hmm. report, below the urban water supplier level and tabulate that information, mm -hmm. that would yield a massive amount of information below the urban water supplier level. That, yep. you know, these systems can't, they, they can't fill out an electronic annual report. They can't even, yeah. barely making it. So, we yeah. should talk more about that yeah. in detail because actually yeah. we, we made, we, I don't think we've thought about the technical details as much as you, but we made that recommendation in our letter to the electronic annual report stakeholder group. Yeah? Hi, uh, Colin Bailey with the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. I was just gonna, in response to Jack's uh, comment, I was whispering to Heather <laughs> that there may be somebody in the room, Liz, or I don't know who, uh, Joaquin. The State Water Board is, uh, has, is pulling together a, an assessment of trying to create a vulnerability matrix mm -hmm. so that we can actually anticipate which systems are going to be in trouble uh, and, and as your suggestion uh, put out there, right. take some action on that. That's, that's part of my point, they're not trouble right now. Yeah. Even though yeah. they're, they're providing clean and safe water to their customers, they're, they they're really are in trouble. It's, it's, it's scary. So, so Is that the needs assessment that you're talking yes. about? Yes. Okay, so yeah. Darren will get yeah. to expand yeah. on that in the panel. Yeah. Quick, quick question yeah. for you. And, uh, on the safe side, uh, the UC Davis report on, in San Joaquin Valley on mm -hmm. disadvantaged, unincorporated communities yeah. used the action limit and demonstrated that there are perhaps you know, certainly scores of uh, unincorporated communities that are drawing water Mm -hmm. that exceed half of the MCL. Mm -hmm. My question for you is, could you comment on the state of the science and consequently the policy on multiple sub-MCL uh, kind of higher levels in, uh, in the MCL but not exceeding mm -hmm. and any possible synergistic impacts? The okay. kind of classic example being the University of Nebraska study on where nitrate and uh, naturally occurring uranium co-occur Mm -hmm. So you're talking about cases where um, where the the level of the contaminant exceeds the limit of the safe drinking water, or it's actually below the it's limit, below, but it still is a problem. Point. Okay, yeah. So I think that um, so our ladder that we developed is very much sort of intended to be a relatively tractable approach to looking at Safe Drinking Water Act violations. Um, but I think you can do far more complex um, efforts at looking at risk to human health um, if you take a, if you actually look at the actual numbers of um, contaminants that are occurring and do a far more complex analysis. And I think that um, Carolina may not be able to talk fully about that because her report is not out yet, but I think that, that OEHA has that risk, pub, that public health risk-based approach, and they have tried to build that into their metric on safe drinking water. What we wanted to do was keep things sort of tractable and approachable from, you know, somebody who doesn't necessarily have a doctorate in public health could take the um, existing safe drinking water information system data and, you know, with some manipulation in Excel, actually give us some numbers. Our goal was to be more tractable, but I think you're right that people can do something more sophisticated, and I think OEHA has attempted to do that. 
<laughs> Any other questions? Uh, one, one more, Colin. Uh, it, was, it was a question about the data quality, yeah. like what we're getting from the census and the ACS. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is mostly a question of what, what, what can we do? You seem resigned to the idea that the ACS is what it is and asks what it asks. Yeah. Is there an opportunity to influence the questions that, it, the that it gets? I received a notice from Senator Pan's office that said they're trying to figure out what the plan is for the, you know, the local census in California. They've got $90.3 million. Do you know of any way mm -hmm. for us to influence it? And should we take charge of that? Yeah, well, I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, there's been a particular party in control of the federal government that's maybe not as excited about transparency in some areas. Uh, as maybe they could be. So, uh, you know, to give you some history on that, the American Community Survey ha has always for a long time collected information on household water and sanitation. Um, and in uh, 2015, they got a lot of pushback from some conservative uh, members of Congress saying that asking these questions was an invasion of privacy and wanting them to completely strip them out. And um, in order to sort of placate them, the American Community Survey did take out the question about whether or not people have indoor flush toilets in their homes. So the last time we have that data is 2015, and now going forward, we no longer are able to track those numbers. So the quality of the information in the American Community Survey, rather than getting better over time, is in fact actually declining, and it's very frustrating. Um, and I would say that similar to a lot of other issues, there's been a lack of attention from people who care about science and data-driven policy to these kind of like <laughs> sub-headline issues. You know, you're not going to make a huge splash in the New York Times by creating an effective campaign to make the American Community Survey monitor poverty better in the United States, but you actually will make a big difference in how informed our policy is, and I think that you know, I, if I could wave my magic wand, I would say that we really need an effective advocacy community advocating for good census data and American Community Survey data.